One of the major purposes of cholesterol is to help synthesize something called bile. So bile is an aqueous mixture that is produced inside the liver and it helps emulsify and break down fat that we ingest into our body. So let's begin by talking about the composition of bile. So bile contains inorganic compounds and organic compounds. So here we have bile, our aqueous mixture produced inside the liver. And so we have inorganic compounds. That just simply means we don't have any carbon. And then we have organic compounds, which means we do have carbon. So the inorganic compound is water. In fact, about 95% of bile is actually water. And so that's why we call this an aqueous mixture. And then we have a variety of organic compounds. And this makes up a total of about 5%. Now, depending on the sources you use, sometimes these percentages can be a little different. But for the most part, we have 95% water and 5% organic compounds. Now, for the organic compounds, the major organic compound are bile salts. And as we'll see, bile salts are simply conjugated versions of bile acids. And they make up about 51% of the total composition of the organic compounds. And then we have phospholipids. The major phospholipid is lecithin. Lecithin is also known as phosphatidylcholine. And this makes up about 25% of the composition of the organic components. And then we have a bunch of other things. For example, we have bilirubin, we have fatty acids, we have cholesterol itself in the unmodified form, and so forth. So because by far the major organic molecule are, uh, is the bile salt, this is what we're going to focus on in this lecture. So remember, when we ingest food that is rich in fat, the liver can synthesize and release bile directly into the duodenum. And the bile is important in breaking up the fat and emulsifying the fat, and that prepares it for absorption by the enterocytes, the cells of our small intestines. Now, in between meals, we can actually store bile in an organ known as the gallbladder. The gallbladder is found right below the liver. So let's begin by talking about bile acids. So bile acids are these organic molecules that contain 24 carbon atoms. So here we have one example of a bile acid known as cholic acid. So we have one, two, three, four of these rings that consist of carbon. And we also have this hydrocarbon chain on one end. And together, if we count, we have 24 carbon atoms. Then depending on the bile acid, we can either have two or three hydroxyl groups. So for cholic acid, we have one, two, three hydroxyl groups. We also have some methyl groups. So we have one, two methyl groups. And then we have the hydrocarbon chain. And on, on the end, we have a carboxyl group. Now, the carboxyl group has a pKa of about 6.0, which is below and relatively close to the normal physiological pH of about 7.2. And so what that means is this bile acid will remain in the partially dissociated form. So some of the cholic acid will contain a negative charge while some will still contain that H plus atom. Now, bile acids are what we call amphipathic molecules. So they, uh, they contain hydrophilic regions and hydrophobic regions. So these hydroxyl groups actually have alpha orientation. So they lie above the plane of the molecule. And that means above the plane, we're going to have hydrophilic regions. These regions are going to be able to interact with the aqueous environment. Below the plane, we have these methyl groups. So the methyl groups have beta orientation. They lie below the plane. And so below the plane, we're going to have hydrophobic regions. This re these regions can interact with the fats that we ingest into our body. And that's why these molecules are great emulsifying agents. The methyl groups, which are hydrophobic, can interact with the fat, breaking up the fat, while the hydroxyl groups can interact with the nearby aqueous environment. Now, how do we synthesize these bile acids? So bile acids are synthesized from cholesterol. 
So we have this multi-step, multi-organelle process in which cholesterol is ultimately converted into primary bile acid. So the two major primary bile acids you have to be familiar with is cholic acid, which we talked about here, as well as kinodeoxycholic acid. Now, in this process, essentially, we reduce the number of carbons by three. So cholesterol has 27 carbon atoms, while these primary bile acids only have 24 carbon atoms. And so that means we remove three carbon atoms from this hydrocarbon chain. In addition, we add the carboxyl group at the end of the hydrocarbon chain. We also reduce these rings, and then we can add hydroxyl groups as well. Now, we're not going to talk about the details of this process, but I will talk about the rate-limiting step of this process. The rate-limiting step of forming bile acids from cholesterol is catalyzed by an enzyme known as cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase. So this enzyme is only found in hepatocytes in the liver cells, and it's bound to the ER membrane. So it's basically a cytochrome P450 um, enzyme. And so this enzyme is upregulated by high levels of cholesterol. So if we have high levels of cholesterol inside the liver cells, it will upregulate the activity of cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase, allowing us to form more primary bile acids. But as we increase the amount of primary bile acids, for example, as the cholic acid levels increase, this creates a negative feedback loop that decreases the expression and activity of cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase. So high levels of cholesterol stimulate this enzyme, while high levels of the products, the cholic acid, downregulates the activity of cholesterol 7-alpha hydroxylase. Now, once we form the bile acids, this is not the end of the story. Once we form the bile acids before the liver cells can release the bile acids, they're first conjugated with either glycine or taurine to form bile salts. So if we take the bile acid and we conjugate it, we form a bile salt. And bile salts are actually better emulsifying agents than, uh, than bile uh, acids. Why? Well, if we add a glycine or a taurine to the end of this carboxyl, uh, carboxyl group, we actually lower the pKa value of this group. And by lowering the pKa value, that means these molecules will exist predominantly in a fully ionized form. And the fully ionized form is better able to dissolve in the aqueous solution than the unionized form that doesn't contain any charge. And so in general, bile salts are better able to dissolve in the aqueous environment than the bile acids. And so bile salts are much better at emulsifying fats than bile acids. In fact, bile acids, when they travel inside the blood, they actually need a transport molecule such as albumin. In contrast, bile salts can simply travel within the blood without, uh, without being bound to any type of transport molecule. So let's summarize what we talked about so far. Via this multi-step, multi-organelle pro uh, multi process inside the liver cells, cholesterol can be transformed either to cholic acid or kinodeoxycholic acid, the two types of bile acids. Then in the liver, we can conjugate cholic acid with either taurine, in which case we form taurocholic acid, or glycine, in which case we form glycocholic acid. If we take kinodeoxycholic acid and we add taurine, we form taurokinodeoxycholic acid. If we add glycine, we form glycokinodeoxycholic acid. And these bile salts are better able to dissolve in the aqueous environment, and so they're better emulsifying agents compared to bile, uh, bile acids. Now, in addition, to aiding, uh, in, in addition to aiding in fat digestion via emulsification, these bile salts are also important because we can actually excrete cholesterol from the body via this process. So, bile salts also provide the only major method of cholesterol excretion, as we'll talk about in just a moment. So, I want to briefly mention that the ratio of glycine to taurine forms is actually three to one. So we have more of the glycocholic acid and glycokinodeoxycholic acid compared to taurocholic and taurokinodeoxycholic. 
So let's finish off by talking about the enterohepatic circulation. So, in the liver cells, we generate the primary bile acids. Those are then conjugated to form the bile salts. And the bile salts are either stored in the gallbladder or released into the duodenum. So if we ingest food that is rich in fat, the bile mixes with the fat in the duodenum and begins to break it down. Now, as the bile salts move along the duodenum and the remainder portion of the intestines, the bacteria can actually modify the bile salts. So, the bacteria can convert the bile salts back to the primary bile acids by removing taurine or glycine. And the bacteria can also then convert the primary bile acids to secondary bile acids by removing hydroxyl groups. And so now in the ileum, we have a mixture of bile salts, primary bile acids, and secondary bile acids. And about 95% of this solution is actually actively reabsorbed back into the portal circulation from the ileum. So the bile salts and acids basically move via the, uh, via the portal veins back into the liver. And now the liver can reuse the majority of these molecules in the same exact process. And this is what we call enterohepatic circulation. Entero means the intestines and hepatic means the liver. Now notice about 5% of the bile salts and acids can actually be excreted in the feces. And so that's why this provides the only major method of cholesterol excretion. So by converting cholesterol into the primary bile acids and then conjugating them into the bile salts, some of it can actually be excreted in the feces. And so in this way, we can rid the body of cholesterol if we have too much cholesterol within our blood. And so we can actually use this and develop drugs to help excrete more cholesterol out of the intestine. So we have medications known as cholestyramine. So cholestyramine is an oral medication that we ingest orally and it moves into the duodenum where it binds and sequesters bile acids and prevents their reabsorption by uh, their reabsorption in an ileum and so ultimately we're able to excrete more of that cholesterol uh, in the feces and that can decrease cholesterol levels in the body dietary fiber can do exactly the same thing dietary fiber can also bind and sequester these bile acids and this can decrease the amount of cholesterol inside our body so patients who have high levels of cholesterol can take dietary fiber or these medications to help decrease the amount of cholesterol within our body and within our bloodstream